uh, in the spirit of iterative design systems, I uh, originally had a slide that just said hello, and uh, throughout the conference, many people have had an intro slide that said hello. So last night, I was trying really hard to think about what what my intro slide should say, and I went through a few different things. Um, I ended back at hello. Uh, it seemed better, um, although it's lit fam was a suggestion from a friend that I greatly liked. Um, also, my coworkers told me to tell a joke in the first 10 seconds, so that is my joke. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we have bridges in Brooklyn and snow, and uh, weird things start to happen when I come to San Francisco. Uh, first of all, I get a sinus infection within the first two days. Happened. Uh, my hair looks like this. Uh, but most of all, I'm blown away by just how warm and welcoming everyone here is, specifically at Clarity. Uh, so before I get into the meat of the presentation, I did want to say a quick uh, thank you to Gina and all the presenters and all you guys for being so patient and listening. Um, it's a really awesome thing that you guys have going on over here, so uh, I'm humbled to be amongst so many talented people, so thank you. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, I am the most interesting man in the world, uh, according at least to my friend Josh Silverman, who wrote my bio for this event. Uh, I'm a little bit more humble than that. I am, I am Jeremy, um, and I'm a graphic designer. Uh, more, specific, more specifically, uh, I specialize in branding, and uh, most recently, in-house. Uh, my first in-house gig was for Etsy. Uh, which is such an amazing company. Uh, I was the first brand designer there, and along with Randy Hunt, I founded the Global Brand Design Studio. Um, it was my first in-house gig, and it made me realize that, to a certain extent, like the future of branding is in-house. Um, after that, I worked at PepsiCo. Uh, I managed global brand for all of their beverages, um, including Pepsi, uh, 7-Up, Izzy, a few others. Uh, this is kind of where I learned about working on a massive global scale. PepsiCo is about 450,000 employees. Um, and then currently I'm at Uber, uh, where I am a senior brand design manager on brand marketing. Uh, so I, I do everything that kind of like goes out into the world, uh, lots of communications, uh, specifically for the United States and Latin America, but I'm also currently uh, managing global. Um, and I've only been at Uber for three months, so I'm not going to answer any questions about the rebrand, uh, particularly not the app icon. Um, but the speed of the company is incredible, and uh, it's, it's a really amazing opportunity to uh, be part of something that's the fastest growing company in history. And so, as you've gathered, and with the exception of, I can't believe I get to say this, Richard Daney, amazing. Uh, I'm the only non-UX person presenting. So hopefully you won't be too bored as I talk about uh, the intangible sort of warm and fuzzy things that is brand. Um, so diving a little bit into brand systems, uh, it's fun work. Uh, it doesn't include a lot of uh, acronyms. Um, and since I'll be talking about emotive sort of concepts, um, I'll divert away from graphs and charts and uh, I won't show any of these sort of like brand books or style guides really beyond this, because uh, that isn't really what's the most important to me. Um, the emotion of, of kind of what I do is the thing that's fun. Um, and so I'm gonna treat you to a series of uh, stock videos, animated GIFs, and metaphors, which I am calling METs today. Uh, I've, called, I've cobbled these together, uh, so it should be pretty lightweight, pretty quick. Um, hopefully we leave a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, maybe we can shout at each other because I haven't heard the audience really participate in that, which could be interesting or detrimental. Um, so the big question is, what is brand? And this is something that a lot of people debate about. It's kind of similar to the debate of what is design. Um, and there's a ton of smart people in this room, and most of you are designers, so uh, I imagine you'll ace this, but like, who knows what a brand is? Show of hands. That's good. That's actually less than I would have expected. Um, so for those of you who don't or who are too scared to not raise their hands, um, brand is defined in a bunch of different ways. And um, there's two thoughts that I think are, I don't want to say the 
most important, but maybe the most widely adopted. And the first is uh, Ogilvy defined brand as a uh, product's attributes, its name, packaging, its price, advertising, history, reputation. Um, and I don't believe that's inaccurate. That's actually pretty awesome. Um, but at the beginning of that, he says the intangible sum. And a lot of companies that I've worked with or for, um, they tend to leave out the intangible part. And I think that's part of, as humans, we like to make sort of tangible. Um, and that's why brand systems are so tricky, because uh, they don't really have physical, real things. Um, so I prefer Marty Neumeier's uh, definition, which is a person's gut feeling about a product, service, or organization. Um, and gut, because people are emotional, intuitive beings. That guy, smart. Um, so regardless of which philosophy you believe to be true, uh, brand is identified by individuals. It's not identified by me. Uh, not identified by designers at large or companies or markets. Uh, and because of that, it's really, really magical. It's, it's something that I get really excited about. Um, just in the fact that if you quiz a day-to-day -day person or consumer or human, uh, most of them don't really know what brand is, and it becomes this sort of invisible art that's hidden beneath everything. Uh, and I say that um, it's invisible because we as humans instinctively feel uh, something through whether it be verbal or visual voice um, or user experience. Uh, it influences our decisions and it brings us joy and it gives us something to talk about and most importantly it gives us stories to tell. So as a brand designer and brand manager uh, when developing brand systems I like to think of myself as uh, three part of three professions. One is a psychologist because uh, I have to evaluate and study uh, the mental process. Uh, designer, look at this line of type machine, um, because we're not only the designer of the systems, the architects of the systems, but we have to think about what this visual voice is and what those components are. And my favorite, magician, um, because one, magicians are pretty fucking cool, uh, look at this guy, uh, but two, there's a sleight of hand involved in it, right? Like. Um, I don't want to say it's trickery, but we're, we're trying to make people feel how we want them to feel through a series of things. Um, and like when they feel that way, it's, it's magic. <laughs> uh, so what all three of those disciplines have in common is that at their core is human perception and uh, how people feel about, think about, and retell their experiences. And uh, that's applicable to all the disciplines, um, certainly. Um, UX work and um, all sorts of systems work, but it's much less tangible in the day-to-day -day of brand. Um, and I deeply care about people, and that's part of the reason why brand is so interesting to me. Um, it's systems design in the direct context of people's day-to-day -day lives, and more importantly, uh, their emotions, uh, which is why systems need to be human. Uh, and that's really tricky. Um, so I've experienced brand in a bunch of different ways throughout my career. Um, so I'll just kind of give you a couple very quick surface level learnings from each of these categories, which vary in size and complexity. So my first job was at a, a small design consultancy uh, brand strategy uh, firm called Juicy Temples in Orlando, Florida, if you've ever been. Uh, it was a small consultancy. It flexed from three to 12 people, um, and we had a lot of smaller clients. And the most interesting thing that I learned there that holds true even today is that the perception that a client or person or business has about their brand is usually very different than the reality of what a brand is. And for example, a hotelier opens a campsite and they want their branding to feel like a hotel because that's what they know, but we all know that campsites don't feel like hotels. Um, writing positioning statements was one of the big things I learned at the small studio scale, and also one of the most challenging things to get clients onboarded to. Uh, corporate, um, I mentioned PepsiCo, a uh, very, very large company. Um, I also worked in advertising for a number of years in a brand and interactive department. Um, same process, but this sort of stuff tends to go really, really long. And it's not long in the sense where, all right, we have six months of research, it's long in the sense of we'll design something over and over and over again because the scale is large and we want to make sure we get it right. Um, but more so, there is a ladder of people and approvals that it needs to go through. And it's kind of like this long fight where each rung you have to sell someone else in and 
then you go back to the beginning and a lot of people weighing in. Um, and in the end, things can be much better because of this, but a lot of times they can be a little bit more diluted, uh, too many cooks. And then startups, where I've spent a lot of my career in very recently, um, could technically be interchangeable with corporation. I think uh, Uber just crossed the 400 city mark uh, globally, which is awesome. Um, but the difference is that what I've found is that the startups I've worked with and worked in, they don't realize that they have or need a brand um, until they reach some sort of scale, which is really interesting because there's a lot of retrofitting that happens. Um, there's a lot of kind of research into the history of the company and how people envision it. And it's super iterative, which is the best. Uh, and that's my favorite part about working um, in sort of the startup world. But where the big issue comes in, in brand design and style guides in general, and as many, many people <laughs> throughout this conference have mentioned, is that uh, lack of real world iteration is a big part of it. And there are many guidelines that say this is intended to be a living, breathing document. Uh, but then with the exception of a few annual editions, it is neither living nor breathing. Uh, months, weeks, years go by, kind of collects dust. And instead of being a long-term investment, which I think a really great brand is, uh, say 50 years or more, uh, people call for a rebrand. A uh, couple of years, it breaks down, becomes stale, or it just never worked to begin with, and you didn't know it because you designed it in a black box. Um, so more money, more designs, but not necessarily better solutions. So we, as a brand industry or design industry or systems industry, I believe are better suited to smaller scale iterative work. Um, what I mean by that is no black boxing of systems. Uh, I think like real world testing is important. Um, we should work closely with each other, particularly researchers. And if you're brand designers, you should work closer with the product team and product designers work closer with the brand team. Um, and we shouldn't, be go, we shouldn't be afraid to go back and edit based on kind of what we find when stuff starts to enter the hands of the everyday designer or, or marketing manager or even consumer, uh, particularly as the world gets smaller um, and somehow more complex. Uh, so you may ask, we do quantitative studies and we have bulletproof guidelines that we're pushing into the world. Um, and that is good and it's part of the process, but there's no such thing as bulletproof design guidelines. Um, mostly because an emotion, particularly in brand, is really hard to systematize. So our systems need to evolve. Uh, they adapt and change during their lifetime. They need to adapt to change uh, during their creation. And a logo might live for decades, uh, if we're lucky, uh, which these days, probably not. Uh, but all the standards will change around it. And this should all be based on kicking the tires in real world situations, not in focus groups or uh, qual testing. So what, what does that mean? Why should you care? Uh, because uh, experience is the brand, and uh, experiences live in people. And uh, it just means that humans own branding. Uh, which brings us to the title of my talk, I think. I think this was it. Uh, brand in the context of people's lives. Uh, we get things like logos and colors and typography to work together, and uh, how do we do that in a predictable way that makes you feel something, uh, despite being a world completely built out of chaos? Um, so I had people's lives when I emailed Gina, uh, when she's like, Jeremy, you have to get me the title. The conference is in weeks. Uh, but I really think it should be human lives, and I, I like replacing people with human, uh, because human means of pertaining to characteristics of or having the nature of people. Um, and that's really important because it's sympathy. And when designing for brand and when designing for user experience or motion or language, um, you've heard such a diverse group of people speak and it's been really amazing to just hear these sort of same themes regardless of what their discipline are come up. And I think uh, sympathy is, is a really, really big one. So human, how do we make systems human? Uh, well, like lives, uh, systems should always be a work in progress. I don't think at any point, I think there's a beginning and there's an end, but throughout the entire middle, it's constantly changing. Um, so uh, in the spirit of METs, metaphors, uh, I kind of put these things together based on the title of the talk. I don't think they are rules um, or grand realizations, but more kind of general reminders to get you guys to kind of feel, uh, which is, 
what I'm getting to. Uh, so the first up I have, breathe. Um, two facets to this. One, I think the guidelines should move in flex. Uh, a lot of times I'll have some of my designers show me some work that they've done and it, and it looks bad. And why does it look bad? Uh, well, they made sure that they matched the guidelines to a T, but maybe the guidelines weren't originally built for this particular instance. And I think sometimes we need to make things look good, even if it breaks a guideline. Um, but it also means that we can kind of grow those guidelines and, and we should rely on elements to stay alive. And much like we rely on oxygen when we're breathing, I think feedback is like the core element that any great brand system relies on, that if you stop breathing it, it'll die. Um, so this could also be called consume, like with food, but that doesn't sound as nice. It's kind of a bummer. Uh, and that comes to grow. So I mentioned there was, a, there was a particular iteration that maybe didn't work in the system. Well, we need to, we need to grow the system. Um, we need to define the guidelines better. And Gina mentioned in a talk that I saw in New York that uh, Salesforce defaults to clarity over brevity, and I believe in that. And you know that you might have to grow over the course of time, and your guidelines will grow as you age, so get swole. Um, <laughs> uh, and learn is probably one of the most important. Um, kind of goes with grow, but uh, we all start as babies. We have basics. We breathe, uh, we eat, we poop. Uh, but we have to learn the essentials of what it is to be human. And uh, guidelines should be viewed the same way. Uh, you gotta test things out. Uh, you won't know if something's hot until you touch it and burn yourself. Um, and you won't know if a rule works or breaks until you actually test it out. So take in everything around you as you grow and you'll be learning. And I think brands will be stronger for it. Uh, my personal favorite, which this talk kind of centers around is feel. Um, and part of that is to tell the stories that are important to you uh, and really feel what it is to be human. Uh, get happy, fall in love, and even experience heartbreak. Fear is an interesting one. It's one that uh, I almost didn't include, but it's still important. Um, again, a two-faceted one. So uh, Neumeier again, he says that uh, the most innov innovative ideas scare the crap out of everyone. And I think that makes fear a really great barometer to if you're doing something worthwhile. Um, at Etsy, a really interesting thing was anyone could push production code to the live site. Um, and that's super scary. But what that fear did was make sure that you kind of crossed your T's and dotted your I's and really felt confident about what you're doing before you did that. Um, so it's really good for character building. Uh, and age is gonna be the last one here, um, and arguably one of the most important ones. Uh, it's okay to have patina on your system. Um, it's okay, it gives it character and authenticity, which is important. Uh, humans are real good natural bullshit detectors. Uh, and we know as designers that like everything new will become old and will eventually become new again. So we could go on and on with this stuff for a long time. I could come up with socialize or explore or create, um, share, which is actually a really important one. And I think all of this speaks to, to systems design, um, but all of it also speaks to us as people, as humans. So I think you get the point. Um, so what I'm getting at is like beauty is beauty is human. And in order to relate to each other, we need to share with each other and uh, we need to create systems that are authentic. We need to tell better stories and most importantly, uh, we need to love things into existence. So I was uh, perusing the internet this week and I came across this film called Human the Movie. And uh, the talk was running a little bit short, which it still is. Uh, maybe we can do some more Q&A. But um, I thought this was really nice because it speaks to sort of the magic, the simplicity, the optimism, um, and humanity uh, that we should be striving towards in all of our work. Um, it's not specifically systems related, but uh, it is about humans and emotion, which really my talk wasn't really about systems to begin with. Uh, so there is some audio. The magic moment that I had with my grandfather was right after my grandmother died. And I went to go see him and I knew that he was hurting, but I wasn't sure what kind of state he would be in. And she was his partner 65 years as well as his driver. And I went to see him and said, Grandpa, how are you doing? 
He said, did you know that for $4, I can get a shuttle anywhere in the city? I was like, wow, that's great, Grandpa. He said, well, I went to Ceylon, I went to the grocery store and went to the woman behind the counter and said, I have this list of things. Could you help me find them? My wife has recently changed her residence to heaven. And I said, Grandpa, man, you always help me see the glasses half full. And he leaned back and he looked me in the eyes and he said, it's a beautiful glass. Thanks so much, guys. Branding guideline. Ignore all of it. Yeah, that was a that was an that was an interesting part about how much you talked about iteration in these things, right? And that uh, a branding guideline not only can evolve but should evolve as it goes. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think that's a relatively new thing. Um, the nature of the work that I'm doing at Uber is very much on this level where my team is sort of uh, subservient to other teams. Um, and what we're doing is we're building out what I consider to be like the real brand, like the day-to-day -day stuff that everyone's interacting with, touching, seeing, feeling. Um, and Uber spent a long time making like this beautiful system and there's a lot of really, really smart people working really hard on it. And it, it's been so interesting to see how parts of that stop working really quickly. Um, and then it's up to kind of us, which is like the next level of defense, if you will, to kind of break that and rebuild it and redefine it and rewrite the rules and work alongside other people. And uh, that made me kind of like look back on sort of my career a little bit and realize how much of it was just like, cool, we built this thing and then we pushed it out and then here are your guidelines, here's your system. Um, that and felt too strict? It's not so much too strict as uh, it just, it, feel, it felt wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in the way that um, there was no real, real testing. And, and, and I greatly appreciate the idea of like living systems where like you build this thing and you push it out and it's like growing out there, but like kind of like just really testing it out. I don't know how you do it in like smaller groups in, in places like say a PepsiCo where you know, you're making a billion, like the minimum viable is like three billion bottles need to be produced for a brand. Like you can't just like, oh, I need to make a couple bottles of this to see how people like it. Um, but like get it into a real environment and well, test it out. you can't test a soda unless you make three billion bottles. I mean, I mean, it's something like that because <clears throat> the scale is just as low. Yeah, so I mean. Good data unless it's big enough. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's part that. It's part of it is like the machine isn't, melt, isn't meant to like test that way. I mean, there's certainly like focus group testing and R&D testing and, and and that sort of stuff, but it just, it isn't as real as like sitting down in one of these chairs and being handed a drink and yeah. then tasting it. And this how do you feel? like candy corn. Yeah, but like how do you feel like in that it. environment in your day to day and like how much do you really like candy corn? I don't like candy corn, by the way. <laughs> Nobody does. Uh, Who likes candy corn? Raise your hand. Dude, that's wow. looking at 6%-ish. Yeah. Not bad. No. Uh, how do you know? Do you have, just you have an instinct? I mean, I guess that's why they hired you. Like, like, uh, like you know, hi Jeremy, I designed this, and you're like, Neh. like, like in regards to something well, being they, good. It's, it's, well, not even good, but <laughs> but the, it breaks our guideline or whatever. So you so you're saying, okay, well, I'm looking at this thing that isn't quite our brand, but I also just got done saying that brands can change and stuff. So is this is this an example of one that should change our brand or like it's wrong in the wrong kind of way? I think that there are like sort of guardrails for that. Um, for me, like you want it to like there, the way that I look at brand is sort of there's this idea of um, there's permanence and then there's like temporary. And then along that you have kind of like the iconic sort of like sector, right? And that's like things that won't change, like your logo, maybe um, your core typography, some of your certain guidelines right. like iconography. And then you move into intrinsic, which are sort of these like day-to-day -day pieces that you make. Maybe it's an email, maybe it's like a point of sale piece, whatever. Uh, and then you move into this sort of like extrinsic, extrinsic world. And like that's where you have like ad campaigns and things that are like more temporary. Maybe they last for a season, maybe they last for like a single piece. Uh -huh. um, and it's kind of like, the stuff all the way on the permanent side shouldn't really change. Right, if but I show you this and the logo's wrong, yeah. you'd be like, well, fix the logo. But if I show you and it's like a colorful video and you're like, oh, it's winter, we're gonna go more black and white. Yeah, and it's kind of the stuff on the other side that can flex and change. Um, but the brand will be the, the brand, like the visual brand, I should say, the visual identity system will be the visual identity, but it's stuff like the core 
tenets of design of like rhythm and composition and focal point. A really strict set of uh, guidelines breaks a lot of those principles, core principles of design. So like if you design a piece and like the logo has the clear area and the copy is at least this many X's away from this and it has a photo, it has whatever other element you need to require, it has the colors but it's upside down, you know, like, and there's no way to fix it because you have a really strict grid system, then like sometimes you have to break that so that good design sort of works without ruining the brand and then figure out why that happened and then document it so that the brand can grow. Yeah, that's a great example of it. That's when you know something can bend. Is yeah, yeah. Because it's just, it like looks like it mostly works and it's like, oh, shoot, it breaks the rules. Why does it? Maybe we can. Yeah, and it shouldn't be at like the whims of the designer or brand manager or whomever. Um, it, it should be purposeful, but I think it like gets down to just like core design and what that means. So this is, I mean, your work at Etsy is like, and Pepsi and, and Uber is like large in scale so much. I mean, I, I work on a team of nine people. Like how much should we be thinking about branding? Have you ever done something on that small scale? Do small companies screw up branding or not think about it as much as they should? Yeah, I think, yeah, and, in, and a lot of companies are kind of early in their lives and I think it's a nice time for them to explore who they are. It's, it's I think, incredibly difficult to define what, your, what a brand is before it exists. Um, oh. which is one of the things that uh, startups are good at, like it exists and they, they kind of figure out what they do well and people have an affinity for them and then they can kind of build their brand on top of that. Um, whereas like when you're launching a new beverage, um, yeah. it's like, well, we know we have to put this out here because there's like this space in the market and we're trying to fill this particular uh, time or demo or whatever it is and then you kind of invent a brand and you don't have the kind of experience of that brand living that people can tell you what it is before it exists. That's, that's kind of wild to think about. And yeah. It's like, just launch and do your thing and figure it out <laughs> along the way kind of thing and your brand will evolve or it just, it just will, yeah. like it or not, in a sense. That's kind of good. So what is the work like right now? I mean, do, do, do you have a, uh, it, was, it was light on portfolio stuff, I mean, probably yeah. on purpose. Is, it, uh, is there like a, a cool thing you can tell us about at Uber? I don't think there's anything I can tell you about it, Uber. Yeah. Um, Very hush hush. No, I will say one thing that uh, uh, we got a little bit of flack. There was like a Wired article, um, and again, like the rebrand largely took place before I was there. I worked on a small, small, small little piece of it. Um, but I, I was really interested that like we as designers, we as an industry, uh, we talk a lot about having a seat at the table and and like how important it is for design to be considered and. And then we also, like, it gets, it seems to get worse and worse every year, but we have this, like, gut reaction. I've talked to a few of you, I think, throughout the week about this, but, like, cool. It started, I think, with Gap was the first big one. Like, Gap redid their logo. Fuck Gap. This looks yeah. terrible. And then it's like, oh, so-and-so did their logo. What and do then, you like on those? Do you, do you kind of sit the fence usually on those fights because you've lived it from the inside? I think, as, I think I, as I get older and I start to work at more and more places, like, yeah, I definitely take some time. And so for the two, two things about that, like, for the Uber rebrand, we launched it, we sent out a tweet, we put up the new brand site, and then um, 15 minutes later, a blog had like a 5,000 word takedown of the new brand, and... You knew that, you knew it was coming. No, knew it was coming, yeah. but it was interesting that it was like, so, like, there's no way that you can understand a brand, which is like a feeling, mm -hmm. in 15 minutes. And you certainly don't know what anyone went through to create this brand. And like, throughout that day, that same blog published, I think, four articles on the Uber rebrand. And a lot of that has to do with like, Uber is a huge company that everyone likes talking about, and we're in the press a lot, for good or bad. Right. Um, but it was just, I think that as an industry, we should kind of be more empathetic to each other, just like we should be empathetic to our users, our consumers. Um, and then the other, the other piece was a lot of people were like, oh, like Travis, who's the Uber CEO, was really involved in the branding process. Like, oh, that must have been terrible. And it's like, no, guys, the CEO is excited about design. <laughs> like, we've, we want to see to the table. There well, was just some assumption that because uh, Exec was involved. It yeah, and I, I'm just like, that, someone mentioned it uh, about like buy-in from the top and like, that's such an exciting place for design to be. It's like, you look at all of these like highly valuated brands and you think about Apple and, and even like Herman Miller or 3M and, and Method and these sort of like, their brand values are so high and these are all design focused companies. They have design led innovation. I think that's 
amazing and we we should like champion CEOs wanting to be involved and we should champion each other's hard work and really try to show that empathy for the type of work that we're all doing. Ooh, that's a good last sentence. We're gonna let you have that one. <laughs> Just kidding. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks guys.